is there's generally most scientists agree that that while we can't explain it all yet just due purely to chemistry and the physics and biology of how the brain how the neurons work there it's, it's basically a science limitation not a fundamental limitation um so essentially it's it's entirely chemistry um you know most most psychedelics work by elevating certain neurotransmitters in the brain um, that basically play around with how your brain perceives your surroundings. So they mess with things like how your senses, um, your sensory data from the areas around you gets input into the brain, which is what causes hallucinations. Um, there's certain classes of hallucinogens that that basically completely isolate your brain from the surroundings known as dissociatives. And they're, they basically, you're, you're essentially, a, if you take enough of those, you're basically a brain in a jar, so to speak. You have no way of interacting with the world around you because all the sensory data gets messed up before it can actually get to your brain. Um, right, it, well, it's, it's, it's definitely interesting and in, in neurology is a field that's really still in its infancy. Um, we've only really known about the existence of neurotransmitters for, I don't know, maybe 50 years. Um, and so it's really, and it's a really complicated problem. So there's certain things, that certain, um, certain chemicals that are correlated with psychiatric disorders um, or mental health disorders like depression or schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is typically tied to, it's not a causative relationship, but they, there's a relationship between having too much serotonin in your, in your brain and schizophrenia, which also mirrors how hallucinogens work. Classic psychedelics work by elevating serotonin in your brain, among other things, to really high levels. So it almost mimics schizophrenia to some extent. Um, and that's one of the reason why, if you have a family history of schizophrenia, you really shouldn't play around with psychedelics. Mm -hmm. Um, because it can sort of tip you into that. Um, so there's there's definitely a, a big connection between chemistry and lots of mental health disorders and um, and drugs. So it's but it is something where it's it's hard to generalize too much. I probably overgeneralized. If there was somebody who studied neuroscience in here, they would probably be upset with me that I said, you know, even as broad as that was. Um, that, that I probably got too specific because serotonin is also tied to a dozen other things in other systems. Every neurotransmitter system in your brain is tied to every other neurotransmitter system in your brain. So if you can't just tweak one concentration without changing everything. So it's really, really hard to kind of turn that into um, this causes that type of, of answer. Um, so Lots of really interesting research being done in those areas, though, um, and it's probably one of going to be one of the biggest fields for the probably for the next thirty to forty years at least in, in terms of psychology research is going to be looking at psychology and behavior of an individual and trying to tie it to the biology and chemistry of the brain, um, and that's you know that's that neuroscience neurology field is that area. Um, just to got a really general case, in what way does chemistry help or advance civilization? Um, well, understanding how consciousness works is a good example, right? We just talked about that. But really anytime you want a new material, if you want to improve something, that's chemistry. It might not be always viewed as chemistry, but going from say making weapons out of copper or tools out of copper in the and in, into making bronze, that was chemistry. That was a huge shift from from the Stone Age to copper to bronze to iron, and then iron to steel. All of that's chemistry. So you can actually track it and tie chemistry directly to different stages of civilization in a lot of ways. Um, I'm going to skip over astronomy for now, just because there's always more astronomy questions that come in shortly. So we'll kind of take those as a group um, and look at 
Uh, how does density apply to alcohol, for instance? So density applies in a lot of places. Alcohol is actually a really interesting one because the number one way that, that the average person can measure how much alcohol is in an alcoholic drink um, is actually by looking at the density. I'm talking about if you wanted to measure it, not just like a taste test or something. Um, and because ethanol, which is the compound in drinking alcohol, has a different density than water. And if you compare what the density of a mixture is, it's gonna be somewhere in between the two. And it's gonna be an average of those two densities, but it's not a true average where you just put them up and, and divide by two. It's a weighted average where the amount of molecules you have of each of them is going to basically influence how, how close your density is to water or to pure ethanol. So basically the stronger the drink is, the closer the density will be to pure ethanol. And the weaker the drink is, the closer the density is going to be to pure water. And so that's, if you do any sort of brewing or winemaking or any sort of fermentation, that's how you can usually tell when your fermentation's done, is you start with what's called a, an original gravity, and gravity in this sense just means density. Gravity means density relative to water. So if you get a, a, an original gravity of say, you know, 1.048, that means that the density of the solution that you're gonna start fermenting is 1.048 times the density of water. And if you let that ferment, the yeast takes that extra sugar that's making it more dense than water and turns it into ethanol, which is less dense than water. So when it's done fermenting, you might get a final gravity that's, I don't know, 0 0.952. I think that's too low, um, but it's been a long time since I brewed, so I don't have these numbers off the top of my head. But being in that range, the difference between where you started and where you ended will tell you what your alcohol by volume is. And you measure that by taking a device that basically looks like a thermometer um, that's got some lead in the bottom and then it's um, covered in glass and you see how well it floats. Where it floats tells you how dense the solution is. And then you can put this into a formula that says, okay, your change in gravity uh, will determine how much alcohol is in your final solution. So at its, at its the most, it's not specifically using density equals mass over volume. It's basically using a derivative of that equation where you do some algebra and you, and you make some assumptions about the density of ethanol and the density of water. And that gets you to something that allows you to predict your ABV for, for a fermentation. And then last but not least, we're gonna start talking about elements today. If not today, then Monday. It is Wednesday, right? Yes. Um, it's one of those days. Next time. Um, so how are new elements discovered? Because there's every time a new element is discovered, there's big science headlines, but they very rarely actually talk about how that actually happens. Uh, originally, it's, you have to, researchers started just by looking more carefully in areas in where you should have had elements. They found gaps in the periodic table when the periodic table was first discovered, it's not the right word, but first designed. Um, Dmitry Mendeleev was the, the Russian chemist who first started writing out a periodic table of elements. And he basically said, well, there's a gap here where there should be an element, but we don't know about one. And so they looked at samples that had those elements around it and they looked really carefully and they found other elements with at really low concentrations. So what they thought was pure aluminum before might have actually been a mixture of aluminum and germanium, for instance. And so that, so originally, historically, it was by noticing gaps where there should have been an element and then looking for it. Um, and then, and so part of that is newer technology. The periodic table is an example of technology. It's an abstract concept, but abstract concepts can be technology, as weird as that sounds. Um, the the uh, using zero as a decimal placeholder is a technology, um, which also seems weird, right? But that's something that had to be discovered at some point. 
Um, so part of it is that when you get new technology, you can look more carefully or it tells you where you should look. And then now these days, what they do is they use particle accelerators. Now we have a pretty good handle on how elements behave. And we found, we filled in all the gaps on the periodic table um, in between known elements. So basically we're trying to add new elements past what we've seen in the um, before. And so we do that by basically um, slamming nuclei together really, really hard um, to get them to go through a fusion reaction. And sometimes with the right conditions, and if you're starting from the right nuclei, um, you get a, nu a nucleus that is a new element. Um, so it's basically mimicking some of the processes that would take place in a supernova that lead to the fusion reactions that make heavy, heavy elements to begin with, naturally. We're just doing that in a particle accelerator instead of waiting for a sun to explode. Um, and actually, we've gotten to the point now where we're actually making elements that would never be made in a supernova uh, because we can actually slam nuclei together with more energy than they would experience in a supernova um, at really small scales anyway. So that's why we're actually getting to areas where it's like, well, we should be able to see a stable element with these properties if we can get these things to smash together just right. Um, and some of them might have some really interesting properties when it comes to densities or conductivities and stuff like that. How do you like, how do they capture that element that they just created? Because I would assume after the explosion, those things dissipate within them. Sometimes, sometimes it's, a lot of them have really short half-lives, which means they disappear really quickly once you make them. You're making a nucleus that's unstable enough that it immediately fragments into pieces. Um, and sometimes looking at what those pieces are that it turns into actually tell you, oh, we made something different because we've never seen these pieces come before. So part of it, it's, it's a little bit like trying to um, determine the structure of a, of a Lego model um, by throwing a baseball at it and looking at the pieces afterwards, um, which takes some interpretation and you don't always get the right answer the first time. So that's why repeatability is so important just because they think they see something different and it looks different than what they've seen in the past doesn't mean that one data point is enough. They have to wait for somebody else to replicate that. They make note of it. They might try to get it published, but then they have to wait on another group to verify their findings before it's actually accepted. Um, so it's it's really interesting field that's getting into um, that's they use some of, the, some of the same tools that they use for particle physics because particle physics does the same thing, except you do small nuclei and you smash them together so hard that the protons fall apart. And then you look at how those pieces interact with an electrical field or various detectors and try to interpret those results. Um, but it's not something we, where we directly observe um, those those new elements necessarily we kind of observe while well, we made something that matches the properties we would have expected. Um, but until you can make large enough samples that you could do something like measure the density or measure the charge it's hard to know for sure. All right relevant questions. Um, we didn't go over the gas tank problem there were a couple people were having some issues wanted to go over how to write, write out the gas tank problem. So let's talk about that. That was a quiz question. All right, and actually I'm going to talk about this question at the same time. How do we know where to start? How do we know where to set everything up? Um, if I give, if I write it out as a conversion problem, like, you know, on our 14, nano years to seconds, then you kind of know where you're starting and where you're supposed to go, right? It might take, if it's a weird unit, it might take a little interpretation or a little bit of thinking, but at the same time, I'm, at, I'm telling you what you're starting with and what to cancel out and where you're supposed to end. If it's a word problem, that's a little bit harder to see. So, how, what's the general strategy for, especially for word problems, for, for conversions like this, the general strategy is 
whatever unit you're starting with, start by trying to cancel it out. And then whatever unit you wind up with next, you try to cancel that one out. You just keep canceling out units until you get to where you want to be, until you get to the only unit left is the one that you want. The same approach applies to work problems. Um, the difference is that it's, if it's not written out where you can see what you're starting with, then you kind of have to interpret what's there. And in general, um, unless I throw a bunch of extra information in there for no reason, which you're not there yet, I'm not gonna try and be tricky like that yet. Um, usually out of all the numbers that are in that first problem, um, all of the numbers that are given are part of a conversion with one exception. And sometimes those conversions aren't all that easy to see. But if you start trying to pull the numbers out of that word problem and write them out with their units, a lot of times it's, it becomes clear that most of them are going to be conversions, just like density is a conversion or speed is a conversion. So what numbers in that problem are conversions? Fifteen point eight miles per gallon. In other words, one gallon. No, it's this one again. That's right. One gallon equals fifteen point eight miles. All right. So that's a conversion. What else is there? Miles to kilometers, we're gonna need, it's not given to us, but we're gonna to need to use that for sure. So we could write that one down if we wanted, 1.609 kilometers equals one mile. We know we're gonna to have to use that because everything's given in miles and the question asks for kilometers. So at some point, we're gonna to wanna to use that conversion. What other numbers are given in there? and? Even if it's not obvious, could we write them as a conversion? What about the tank? One tank equals 18.2. So a lot of times there's gonna be sort of clue words like has, is if anytime you have you say you know the distance between my house and and the college is 18 miles that is a conversion it might not be a helpful conversion but anytime you say to the word is or equals or has those are all telling you you have two things that are equal to each other which means it could be a conversion so then the last number is one i heard over here which was two tanks, right? Is two tanks part of a conversion? No. Yes, just because everything else is? No, or? Yes. And because I'm guessing one tank equals a certain amount of 18.2 and then two would be just the conversion. So, so all you're doing there, you actually are using the one tank equals 18.2 conversions to convert two tanks into gallons. Two tanks is not in itself a conversion. That's your clue that that's where you're supposed to start. There will almost always be just one number that's not part of a conversion. That's this number. That's the number that you start with. That's the unit you're gonna start canceling out. So if we, if we start with two tanks, and we want to cancel out tanks. And the idea is if we can go from tanks of gas to kilometers traveled. That's our original, that's our problem, right? So we're just writing it out like we're a conversion that we're used to seeing. This is what we're trying to do. So that means that we want to start by trying to cancel out tanks. We only, tank is a really weird unit, right? You have to be given some information about that. 
that's our one tank equals 18.2 gallons, right? So knowing where you're starting tells you what conversions you're gonna to need to use. So you can go two tanks, and for every one tank, it's 18.6 gallons, 18.2 gallons, sorry. And now all of a sudden we're in units that might make a little bit more sense. What else could we do once we're in gallons? We can cancel out gallons. There's a lot of ways we could go with that, right? But we want to pick the one that gets us closer to our final answer. Because any conversion with gallons is valid here, but they don't all lead us where we want to go. Like I could say, I to make the next conversion, one gallon is 231 cubic inches. But that's not really relevant, right? That doesn't take us where we're trying to go. If I asked you for directions to Blue Dog Pizza and you told me to go get on 50 West until I get over Echo Summit, that's not all that helpful, right? It's, you're telling me how to go somewhere, but it's not where I want to go. So every conversion should be getting us closer to where we want to go. We need something that's going to take a volume and convert it to a distance. And that's where our mileage comes in. Because we can cancel out gallons, and now we're in a distance crowd. So I'm going to bring that over here to keep going, where everybody can see. For every one gallon of gas burn goes 15.8 miles. I drive a really old car. <laughs> What's the last thing we need to do? Miles per kilometers. So, Again, most people had at least an idea of where to go, even if they didn't get a, the right answer. But a lot of you I've noticed looking at your work for those of you who included your work for number one on your PDF for number two, which is a good idea, um, didn't necessarily know why they were doing the math they did. Right? Because most of you stopped writing units and just started, I started seeing, well, I'm going to multiply by 15.8. But you didn't say why you were doing that necessarily. Write your units so that you can show what's canceling out. And then it makes it a lot more clear whether you're supposed to multiply two by two or not, or, and whether or not you're done. Right? Because a lot of people, not a lot of people, some people just said, well, Maybe the rest of this is all extra, and I'm just going to take that mileage and convert it to kilometers. And they got a, they got 50 point something. So that is the mileage in kilometers per gallon, but it doesn't actually answer the question. The question is how many kilometers can you go for a certain volume? And that's the one that's trickier to see. So in terms of general strategies, start all the numbers that are in your problem can be written are either where you start or they're a conversion so start by trying to write them all out as a conversion and then the one that you can't write as a conversion is the unit you want to start canceling out right? that falls apart if i give you extra information like if I just stuck a sentence in the middle that says the distance between my house and Lake Tahoe is 1.5 miles, that really does not matter, right? That's a bit of a red herring. I'm not going to do that to you too often, but it's easy to do because there's lots of different things we could measure, right? Um, so for now, for these word problems, assume I'm not giving you extra information. Occasionally I do because I write, write a word problem and then somebody figures out that there's a more efficient way to solve the word problem than what I planned. 
um, and a bunch of the stuff that I gave you was superfluous. I try not to do that too much. Though. I'm not trying to be confusing. I promise. All right. Last thing. I asked two two more questions. Um, how do we know how to do these area? We kind of left the area versus volume and volume conversions alone once we, we did a couple practice problems, but that is kind of a tricky concept, right? So let's do a practice problem. Um, let's look at, let's figure out the volume of this room in cubic centimeters. And I'll make the estimates for the volume for you. Although if I just ever ask an open-ended question like this, I'm generally, you're gonna have to make some assumptions. You just wanna say what those assumptions are. So I'm assuming the room is this size, for instance, and it can be really broad sometimes. So just because we got a really big number when we did the square footage the other day, I'm gonna revise those down and say that, it, that this room is, you know, 20 feet by 30 feet rather than 25 by 50 because that gave us a really big number. And let's say that it's the same height on average as it is deep. So 20 feet, nah, it's probably more like 15 feet. So 15 feet high. And our volume, remember for for a box, let's just treat it like it's a box for the sake of making this simple, is length times width times height. So let's say that the height's 15, the width, call that 30 feet, and we'll call the depth or the width, length, I guess, is the one that we haven't used yet. Um, we'll call that 20 feet. And we'll say that each of those is two sig figs. So our volume will be in two sig figs once we multiply this out. Let's see, 45, what's nine, 900, 9,000. So 9.0 times 10 to the three feet cubed. All right, so since this problem, we want practice in converting volumes using known, um, known conversions, we're gonna try and take this from cubic feet to cubic centimeters. And actually, let's let's go all the way to liters at the end, just for fun. So if we have a number in cubic feet and we need to get it to the metric system, you can take you can go look up a conversion for for a volume in metric units to imperial units. Um, I think the only one on your conversion sheet goes quarts to quarts to liters. Um, that's not a really useful one though, because that means we have to convert cubic feet <coughs> to quarts somehow, and then we could get to liters that way. So let's use the conversions that we know. We know we can go from feet to inches and inches to cubic centimeters. We just need to do that three times if it's a volume but the same conversion works. So 9.0 times 10 to the three cubic feet, we know that every one foot is 12 inches, but we need to cancel out all three powers. It's feet cubed. So we need to cancel out feet three times. So we cube the conversion as well. And that means you 
you cube everything in the conversion. 12 cubed, inches cubed, one cubed, feet cubed. And then if we wanna to go to cubic centimeters, well, we know a conversion for one inch is 2.54 centimeters, and we need to do it three times. So we'll stop there first before we go to liters. So the way that you would input this on a calculator, be write out your number in scientific notation. If you're using that E um, abbreviation, you could do that. I always forget how far off it is at the bottom here. So I will switch to writing it on the board. So 9.0 times 10 to the third times 12 cubes. Because we're cubing everything in there, but one cube is still just one, right? So we don't need to worry about that. Feet cubed cancels out, it'll be inches cubed. And then we're going to say multiply by 2.54 cubes. All right, and if you watch your order of operations, that means that each of these cubes happen before the multiplication. So this should do the, that problem right. Or you could do times 12 times 12 times 12. You don't have to use the pair. If you're using a simple calculator that doesn't have exponents on it, if we're only dealing with powers of three, you can just say tw times 12 times 12 times 12. That's the same as times 12 cubed. And we'll get a pretty big number here, right? Something to the, let's see, 10 to the, it'll be like 10 to the six, then another 10, so like 10 to the seven, something times 10 to the seven? No, it's nine, probably times 10 to the eight? What is it? Uh, 2.5 times 10 to the eight. 2.5 times 10 to the eight cubic centimeters. And if you wanted a ballpark answer before you plugged that in, nine times 10 to the three is really close to 10,000, right? Which is one times 10 to the four. I don't know what 12 cubed is, but I know that 12 squared is 144. And then multiplying by another 12 is like multiplying by 10 again, right? So that's like multiplying by a thousand. So 10,000 times another thousand. And 2.54 to the third is going to be in the 10 region as well, really roughly. So 10,000 times 1,000 is 10 million, or 10, which would be 10 to the seven times another factor of 10, giving us 10 to the eight. It just, again, ballpark, just trying to get an idea of whether or not I did my math right before I hit enter. If we want to convert that to liters, now we're converting volume, a metric volume to another metric volume. So you might want to convert your conversion sheet. What did we learn in lab last week when it comes to cubic centimeters and how they're related to liters? It's one milliliter, right? A cubic centimeter is exactly the same by definition as one milliliter just the way that the units and prefixes work out. So with that in mind, we can just say one, 10 to the three or a thousand cubic centimeters equals one liter. So 2.5 times 10 to the eight cubic centimeters and a thousand cubic centimeters 
is one liter. And that one we don't need the cube, right? Because our conversion already has the cube unit in it. This conversion already cancels out all three powers. So therefore we don't need to cube this whole thing. So we get a number like 2.5 <coughs> times 10 to the five liters, 250,000 liters. That's still a little bit tough to visualize with this space, but it's not an unreasonable amount. If you divide that by four, you get a number in gallons roughly. So something like 50,000 gallons. Uh, this is room is right around 50,000 gallons. That doesn't seem all that off. If you think in, in big aquarium terms, I think the biggest aquarium in the world is the one in Atlanta that has a whale shark in it. And I think that one's in like the 2.5 million gallon range. So calling this 50,000 gallons, okay, maybe. We wanted to go one step further and put this in cubic meters because maybe that's a little easier to visualize. We can either look up a number for liters to cubic meters on our conversion sheet, which is on there, or we can take this number and put it in cubic meters, right? Because we know, what do we know about centimeters to meters? Meters is 100 centimeters. So we have 10 to the 8 cubic centimeters, and every 100 centimeters is one meter. We have to do that three times, but that will give us a number in cubic meters. So, and then that'll wind up when you cube this, we're going to divide by 100 cubed which is in a hundred cubed is a million. You think of this as 10 to the two, and then you're going to cube it. 10 to the two times 10 to the two times 10 to the two, 10 to the six, which is a million. So we're going to get a number in the 2.5 times 10 to the two cubic meters. So 250 cubic meters. Does anybody have a good frame of reference for what a cubic meter looks like? Right, are we going back um, full circle? I don't mean, start with cubic meters. We start with cubic feet. Oh. Because I could, I estimated the volume of this room in feet because that's how my brain thinks based on how I was raised. If you were grew up thinking in meters, I'm jealous. I still have to deal with the British system in my own subconscious. There's nothing I can do about that. Probably most of you are in the same boat. I always think of a, a cubic meter and a cubic yard are roughly the same, and a cubic yard is like the back of a pickup. I just remember having to spread gravel in my parents' yard and drill and or uh, mulch. We always ordered it by the cubic, cubic yard, and it was about one pickup bed full as a cubic yard. So the volume of this whole thing being 250 cubic meters, 250 truck beds, uh, how, that's roughly what we're looking at here, right? Not <laughs> out of, of an estimate. Could we do better? Absolutely, if we got out of tape measure. And we would definitely be reporting more than two sig figs then too, right? So again, sig figs make a difference. Uncertainty matters because what we're saying here is I could be off by as much as 10 cubic meters, 10 truck beds full. I'm probably not off by a whole hundred truck beds, though. So. All right, so with that in mind, any other quiz questions? First off, are we feeling, feeling okay about using conversions that we already know, but with higher powers? It's just anytime you've got a conversion that you know 
at a lower power, quote unquote lower power, you can use that. You just might have to square it or cube it. Right? So that limits how many you have to have memorized then. If you just have your distances memorized, that means you also have area units memorized and um, volume units memorized. Um, for the quiz, let's see. Is the first one the pounds? It was for for the one that had a couple of short conversions in a row. It was 115 pounds, uh, 473 milliliters. 0.44 seconds for the nano years, the seconds one. Oh, there's the mill megameters was something times 10 to the eight, 10, 10 to the seven feet, I think. Was it megameters to feet? Is that the last one? I think it was, what is it? Anybody who has a number written down for that last, for the megameters to feet one, if your answer is to the seven, you probably did it right. <coughs> to the six? Okay, then I'm probably I'm just misremembering. Um, so, so it depends a little bit on how you put it in scientific notation. Um, and there is a common mistake with that is converting meters into centimeters, because a lot of people are still thinking in powers of 10 to the 3. It's only 100 centimeters per meter, not 1,000. So that's a place where you could be off by a decimal point. Um, and the other thing is, if you put it as, I think it's what, 5.08 or something? Times, I think it was times 10. It's, it's seven. Seven. Okay. So if you put this over by one, because you weren't thinking about scientific notation properly like yet, then you might've gotten 10 to the six. If you said a thousand centimeters in a meter, then you might've gotten 10 to the eight. Right, there's a couple of places where it's easy to, that's what I always call slipping a decimal place when you get the right number here, but the wrong power. And that most common place is either with the prefix conversions or um, putting it in scientific notation properly. I just can't count. Just can't count. That, that's a place too. I can't do anything about that. <laughs> Density one could move that before I pull myself on it. Um, the density one was 5.44 cubic centimeters. And number one was 925 kilometers on two tanks, I guess. Okay. All right, and then last but not least, because we started talking about phase change. Um, why do certain things like plastic melt instead of burn? Or you could phrase it as, why do certain things like plastic burn instead of melt? Right, because we talked about how phase changes, everything has a set of conditions where it could be um, a solid liquid gas or that that fourth phase supercritical fluid or even multiple different versions of solid, depending on what that substance is. You know, something like uh, phosphorus has three different forms where you can find pure phosphorus. It can be red phosphorus, white phosphorus, or black phosphorus. When black phosphorus is really more like violet phosphorus. Um, and you make those different forms, they're all solid, but you make those different forms by changing the conditions when you get it to solidify, changes what that crystal structure looks like. So why do some things not melt? Well, a lot of times, all burning really is, and we talked about this a little bit when we talked about why, how does the sun burn without having oxygen, right? Burning is, just a common language for describing oxidation, which means when something reacts with oxygen in the air to basically let oxygen steal some electrons and everything becomes more stable because oxygen is really greedy when it comes to electrons. Um, so some things burn instead of melt because when you get them hot enough in the presence of oxygen, 
they oxidize. They turn, it turns to most plastics are carbon based, so it turns to CO2 instead of going to being liquid plastic. Um, if you change the conditions, if you heated up a plastic in the absence of oxygen, then it'll melt. But as soon as you introduce oxygen, it'll catch fire. Right, because once you get it above a certain temperature, you give, basically give everything enough energy for those, the, that compound to be oxidized. It just needs oxygen to finish the process. Um, and even metals, we don't think of metals as burning typically, but metals will oxidize very, very quickly in the presence of oxygen too. That's actually what a solid fuel rocket booster is. Um, the earliest solid fuel rocket boosters were powdered aluminum um, mixed with permanganate, I think, something that was an oxygen source. Because if you take powdered aluminum, apply enough heat to get it started on oxidizing, it oxidizes really, really quickly and gives off a bunch of energy and, and gas molecules so it can work as a propellant. So a lot of things will burn instead of melt until you change the conditions. If you do it without oxygen around, everything will melt eventually. What kind of, what are the combustion engine? So the, it's not really the, the net reaction. So a combustion reaction in general, um, we're going to talk about the light filtration another time, but basically is, is glucose, which is C6H12O6, plus oxygen reacts to make CO2 and water. And that's the general form of any combustion reaction. Um, typically going to be a carbon-based compound plus oxygen gas makes CO2 and water. It always makes the same product, just in different ratios. So this is the net result of what happens when your body breaks down glucose, but your body doesn't really combust it. It doesn't do it all in one step. It does it in a huge number of steps. You're counting all up. Just if you started with glucose, went through glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, and then the electron transport chain, you're looking at, I don't know, 25 reactions or so. And what that does is it allows all of, a lot of those reactions are going to be oxidation reactions. And the sum of all of them looks like a combustion reaction, but all of them individually, the fact that we break it up into more than one step is sort of like having six hydroelectric dams as water goes from, from Tahoe's elevation down to sea level. If you, if you only had one hydroelectric dam, you can only capture energy in one place. But if you have it broken up into a bunch of small steps, you can capture energy at a bunch of places along the way, and you can make the whole process more efficient. So while the, the total reaction looks like a combustion reaction, your body doesn't actually burn sugar. That phrase burning calories is this process because overall that's what the net result looks like. It looks like it's been burnt. Um, and that's actually how we measure calories in food, at least the old school way of doing it. Because you take a sample of your food and you burn it and you watch how much it heats up a water sample. And then you use the water sample, the change in temperature of the water sample to figure out how many calories the water absorbs. We don't really measure calories like that anymore because it doesn't take into account the fact that there are some molecules our body doesn't digest fully. So for instance, if you burned paper, you could get a caloric value for paper, but humans don't have the ability to break down cellulose into calories. So you can eat as much paper as you want or grass or corn silk, and you're not, going to actually get any calories from it, despite the fact that if you burnt it, there would be calories there. So talking about burning things is a, is a simple way of understanding things, but as, as with most things in chemistry and life, the real situation is more complicated. All right, and just to get us, before we take our break, let's take a couple, um, minutes to finish reviewing where we ended on Monday, especially since we didn't have figures for me to show you. 
um, given the lack of technology issues. And we talked about temperature scales and how temperature is basically a way of measuring the kinetic energy of molecules. You're basically measuring how fast the atoms are vibrating or moving. So temperature is gonna be the number one way we do that, but we do have different temperature scales. And in general, they all behave the same way. The only difference is going to be what we call zero and what we call some other arbitrary amount. So for Celsius and Fahrenheit, Celsius and Fahrenheit both have an arbitrary zero set and an arbitrary 100 set. And they just take that distance and they break it up into 100 markings. That's actually where the term degree comes from is basically if you take a set interval and break it up into chunks, then every amount of that interval is, is one degree of that change. So in the case of Celsius, we set zero at freezing point of water and set 100 mm -hmm. at the boiling point of water. Um, Fahrenheit sets zero at the coldest temperature Lord Fahrenheit could get, which was a mixture of ice and salt. Um, not really all that relevant and not all really all that useful. And set 100 at, again, the way I heard it was the body temperature of a cow. Um, again, you're not really going to use that because Celsius is a lot, makes a lot more sense. But if you wanted to do things in absolute units for temperature, where zero actually means no molecular motion, we have to do it in Kelvin. And Kelvin doesn't have degrees, actually. You don't say, people say degrees Kelvin, but it's wrong. Because Kelvin is not defined by saying, here's zero, here's 100, let's chunk it up in the middle. So technically it's not a degree of anything, um, which is one of those things I'm embarrassed to say. It took me um, 15 years of teaching this stuff before I actually put together what degree actually means. Um, something that could have been solved by looking at a dictionary earlier on in my career. But not all that relevant. Main thing, and I'm not going to mark you down if you say degrees Kelvin or anything like that. But if you're ever curious why you why in, in textbook, you don't you write 273K for a Kelvin, not degrees K. That's why. Um, and all of them, like I said, it's a pretty straightforward conversion between these, but it's more complicated than the conversions that we normally do. Right, so in general, the trickier one is Fahrenheit to Celsius, because Fahrenheit and Celsius have a different slope of the line and has a different intercept. So all that really means is that we have an equation that basically looks like y equals mx plus b. Temperature in Fahrenheit is equal to a slope times the temperature in Celsius plus an intercept. And your units look weird on this. I don't know who's taking a math class where you actually put units on a, on a equation for a line. Maybe a few. Most math classes don't teach that because most, most mathematicians don't care about units. I don't think they would even fight me on that one. Um, the units on the one, the one point eight is an exact number, and the units are actually one point eight degrees Fahrenheit per degree Celsius. So, in other words, if you go up one degree Celsius, that's like going up one point eight degrees Fahrenheit, and that plus thirty two is just Fahrenheit. It's just a, an intercept that shows up because zero Fahrenheit, zero Celsius are not at the same point. And so the 32 and the 1.8 are exact. Um, and if we wanted to convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius, we would just plug in whichever one we have, solve for the other one, just like um, we did in lab is this week. No, we did that last week with the. Uh, now we didn't have line of best fit till this week, huh? The line of best fit. Um, it just means you need to be careful with your units. And I'm gonna give you the general way this works. This won't work for every Y equals MX plus B, but for temperature, 
generally speaking, your answer is always going to be plus or minus the same amount. The uncertainty will always be the same amount for temperature because this slope is really close to one to one. Right. So if you measure bulk or the um, you know your body the body temperature of somebody with a fever as what's who knows who's been uh, working in the medical field a little bit. What's body temperature in Celsius normally? 38 even? 37? All right, so let's say that you had 38.8 degrees Celsius with somebody's body temperature. If we want to convert that to Fahrenheit, we're going to wind up with the uncertainty in the same place. And we can track that through and find and figure out why that is. If we're in Celsius and we want Fahrenheit, we're plugging 38.8 in right there, right? And that means when we multiply, we're going to keep three sig days because that 1.8 is exact. And sometimes you see the 1.8 written as nine fifths, nine over five, which is exactly 1.8. So with that in mind, 1.8 exactly times 38.8 plus 32. When we do that multiplication, what do we get? Thirty-eight point eight times one point eight, sixty something. Before you add the thirty-two. So, temperature in Fahrenheit equals. We only get to keep three sig figs there though, right? So it's 69.8 plus 32. And now we're into addition mode, right? And when you do addition, you keep the uncertainty in the same place. So that would give us our 10, you say 101.8. Right, so basically there are places where, where that general rule breaks down. It's usually a, a better idea to pay attention to just the order that you're doing these steps in. Do your multiplication and round, then do your addition because you won't be doing any, any rounding after you do your addition. But a cake, where you wind up crossing over into, you know, into a new decimal place, Sometimes that means that you wind up getting an extra sig fig out of it, right? The fact that we added 32 and that took us above 100, we get four sig figs on our answer, even though we started with, with only three. And the opposite can happen too, where you can lose a sig fig. So just pay attention and I'm, this is one of the two common places where these mixed operations show up and you, it's really hard to keep track of how many sig figs to keep. It's this and percent error are the two common places that you actually will use where you have to pay attention to it. If we wanted to put, um, if we wanted to put 38.8 in Kelvin, what would that be in Kelvin? So temperature in Kelvin is equal to 38.8 plus 273.15. And that is a measured number. Very rarely will we actually have temperatures that go past the hundredths place. Most, most thermometers stop at the tenths place. So uh, 273.15 is accurate enough for almost all cases, but it is a measured number. So what do we get for our answer there? 311.95 and how many sig figs do we keep? 
So I, I guess maybe I asked that in a misleading way. What is the uncertainty on our answer? To the tenths, which means we keep an extra sig fig, right? So 312.0. Because our uncertainty is to the tenths here, which means that extra 0.15 doesn't really matter. We're gonna, our answer is gonna be plus or minus 0.1, right? Because we're doing addition now, not multiplication. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at 11 after and we'll talk about energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think this is more of a practical mistake for you to give me an idea of what exactly Good. is so That's here. why it's there. Um, my only question is why does the heat of men equal the opposite of the heat of the women? So that's sort of a we can we can qualitatively show that that's true by thinking about it. Where did the metal the metal lost energy right because mm -hmm. its temperature went down? Where did it go? In the power in the water. So if the metal lost it and the water gained it. It would be the, the same, but with a negative sign. Okay. Okay. We do that a lot in chemistry and physics, where we can say, okay, well, this sample I know something about, and I know that it went to the surroundings and then we can do something with that, so. Okay. Got it, thank you. Sorry. No, no problem. Because I get that wrong so I can concentrate. So it's 10 to the seventh, did I just count this wrong? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep, 800 Wait. and then 740 and then one more. So what if there's just so many zeros? Where do I go to stop? So if you're writing, so first off, we only want to keep three sig figs because we started with three sig figs. Oh, right. Okay. So that means you'd stop at 5.07. 5.07. But okay. we still need to say where the decimal point started and ended. So, and if I write it, if you write it out with the commas, so is it 504740? No, what is it? 5.0708. So your decimal point starts there. And then putting in your commas will help you figure out how many you have, right? Because you can chunk that up into three, then six, yeah. and then one more. So the sig fig determines how many digits you write down, 5.07, yeah. where the decimal starts and ends tells you what the power is. Okay. So 5.07 times 10 is seven, because wow. you gotta go three, then another three, and one more. Okay, what if this wasn't here? It wasn't seven more zeros. Then before you got to your if I calculated for and then your decimal yeah. comes in there. Then same thing, you just count three, six, nine, 12, 13. So that power on a scientific notation is always saying, how far did you have to move the decimal point to get it to be one from the end? And then what about this one? Is this totally off? <laughs> um, it is. I don't know where it's so, so the number of digits you write down is just when you started with 14, that's two sig figs. So you only keep two sig figs there. So it'd be 1.3. It might be still times 10 to the 18, but if you had it, but you, you would write 1.3 times 10 to the 18. The number of sig figs you write has nothing to do with this number. The number of sig figs you write has to do with how many sig figs you started there. This has to do with how big the number is. How many places, right? Right. Right. So what is the answer to the question? 
it should have been 0.44 seconds, I think. 0 0.44 seconds. So I, probably, I don't know where that conversion came from, but that seems way too big. Why one, is it end of year? Because one year is not that many seconds. One nanometer is not that many seconds. It's not that many nanoseconds. So I, I don't know how many seconds are in a year, but the way I would approach it is say, well, I know how many days are in a year, and I know how many hours are in a day, and I know how many seconds are in an hour. Exactly. It takes practice. So in hours, rather than any time you're trying to look something up for a conversion, think about if you know the steps for it. I don't know how many seconds are in a year, but I know all the things that don't change. So you know, if I said, okay, I have one year and I want to figure out how many seconds that is, I'm going to say, okay, well, I know one year is 365.24 days. And then you have to look up to get all the days, but you can at least start from there, right? And then you could say, well, I know one day is 24 hours. And I know one hour is 60 minutes. And then you can get seconds, right? So just right off the bat, 300 times 20, that's going to give you something like 700, probably. Just for the sake of uh, having a ballpark number. Then I'm going to multiply by 60 and multiply by 60 again. So 700, you can call that multiply by 100 twice, just to make math easy. 700 times 100 is still only going to be 70,000. And then another hundred would be seven million. Um, I think I'm actually just one of But either way, it's not anything that's going to be 16 for sure. Right? So that's that's just looking at that, that conversion. Nano is a billion, actually. A billion. Right? So then, for me, it makes sense if that's So this is. The part that gets you from years to seconds, but if we're starting at nano 14 nano years, a nano year is a lot smaller than a regular year, right? Nano just means things that are small. So there's that 10 to 9 multiplier, which means, okay, well, I don't, I'll actually say, okay, well, I know that there's a lot of nano years in one year. And then you know, look up the kind of dynamic thought. But that makes sure that you say this one makes sense. I know this many years tiny, so it should take a lot of them to make one year. And now the rest of this keeps going. So the problem part of where you went wrong, some of places where you went wrong. Um, part of where you went wrong was you probably multiplied by 10 to the But something else also happened because if you just did that, you would have the right number with the wrong decimal, which is 4.4 times 10 to the something, and your something would be on. If you did everything else right, but just messed this up. Right? So the fact that you have one point something instead of four point something. Tells me that there was something else going on in there too. Maybe another like multiply when you were supposed to divide or something. But it's tough to say when it's all combined into that one conversion. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. And you showed the units and everything. When you round it in the right spot, you've got 100%. I just have. Uh, are you going to these? Yeah, I, I did traders just towards the back of the alphabet. I think I'm only on the M's oh, right no, now. So. Right. I just did it yeah, no, you'll go. Like so, this I did times two. Oh, well, so, you two get cases. one and a half points out of two for that. Three. Easy. Yeah. Easy to do. Okay. <laughs> Is it normal if I don't have a grade on my lab? Yeah. 
one or yeah it'll, so good point and we're just coming back now so that's perfect all right we're going to start with another practice problem for converting temperatures um quick note about grading as i mentioned um it takes a long time to do grade 15 of any assignment uh and i'm really bad about grading maps in particular <laughs> um so with that in mind just know that if you turn something to a couple things, this is one point in favor of turning in labs digitally, is it'll show it up as turned in but not graded. If you turn it in on paper, then it, it'll show up as a missing assignment on Canvas. Um, there's nothing I can really do about that until I get to the grades. Um, if you've turned it, if you know you've turned in an assignment, um, and it shows up in Canvas as a, a hyphen or a pair of hyphens, just dashes. That just means I haven't put a grade in yet. Doesn't mean that it's missing. If it's missing, and you turned it in on paper and I lost it, or you thought you turned it in on paper, but it never got to me, then it'll show up with a zero once it's graded. So showing up with no grade just means that I'm behind. Showing up with a zero means that I graded that assignment and I don't have yours, right? So either send me an email, if you, for instance, if you email me assignments, that's a great way for, for me to forget about them because most people either submit them on Canvas or give them to me in paper. If you email them to me, in, in a pinch, I'll still accept that, but it's gonna sit in my email inbox and I'm gonna forget it's there and I'm gonna give you a zero and you're gonna have to remind me, hey, no, I sent you that email, right? So. The other way to do it, you know, if you get a zero for something that you know you did, double check it's not still sitting in your backpack somewhere, because that's the other most common place. When things get turned in on paper to me, I'm pretty good about not losing them. It's not a guarantee, but I lose about one assignment every three years is my track record um, thus far. So typically speaking, if you turn it in on paper, I have it. I might be in a weird stack, like especially if you turned it in at a weird time, it might've gotten shuffled in with another assignment, but I'll get it there eventually once I figure that out, once I grade that next assignment. Um, what I have found anecdotally is that it's far more likely that an assignment gets lost in your backpacks than mine. Not pointing fingers, just saying that's been my experience. Um, and that can't happen if you turn it in on Canvas. So if you're worried about that or showing up as being missing on Canvas bothers you, just turn it in on Canvas. Then it doesn't show up as missing anymore. If it does show up as missing, I forgot to go over this earlier. Um, so on student view, the test student has not turned anything in. So it's got a whole bunch of things in the to-do list over on the right-hand side. If you just look at the Canvas app, it'll look a little different, but if you're on um, the website on a laptop, you'll have something that looks like this. Anything that you know you turned in um, that's still showing up on your to do, if it really bothers you, you can just submit something that says, I turned this in on paper, or just X out of it, make it go away. Um, if you submit an assignment and you attach the wrong file, or you need to attach if you need to attach more than one file, usually it will let you do that on Canvas. If you want to up, do a file upload, you know, start assignment, choose file, pick your files. And so let's say I wanted to attach that. Um, and this one's going to be picky about it because, because I put a restriction on it. Um, you can also add another file by doing that as well. But if you ever submit something and then, let's see if I can remove it that way or if I have to re, redo it. Um, if you ever submit something and then you need to go back and attach something else to it, you can always resubmit. There we go, that'll work. It'll take a minute to upload. So let's say I submitted that and then I, I realized I made a mistake and I wanted to go back and add something or you submitted your written assignment, but now you need to attach your Excel file from this week's lab. You can just do a new attempt and submit just the one that you, um, that you already or that you need to add. So, and now when you hit 
submit assignment. It shows, it'll only show up as having one file attached, but I see both submissions. On my end, when I grade, it'll show up as they submitted a file here, and then they did another submission where they attached the file. If, if I'm missing half your assignment, I always go looking in the other submission. So anytime you've got something else you need to attach after you've hit submit, just resubmit it and I'll see that and I'll be able to, to give you the credit for that. Right? So on my end, it looks something like, uh, let's see. Let me, how can I do this without, none of these are graded yet. So, so for that test student that submitted two different files, um, it shows up over here for me when I grade it as I, that there's two submissions. And so I can say, okay, well, this one has this file attached. The second one has a different file attached. So I can see both of them, even though you can't. Once you resubmit, it looks like it overwrote it. It doesn't on my end. I can see everything that gets submitted. Um, but to some extent, I always start with the most recent file. So if you submit something that's wildly incorrect and then figure it out and resubmit it, I, I will look at the most recent one first. And I only go looking in the older submissions if something is missing. If you have submitted pages one and two, but then not three and four, I'll go looking for three and four in the other submissions. And plus, should not be embarrassing to turn in work that needs to, that needs work, right? That's why you're in this class. Nobody's supposed to be perfect in this class yet, other than me, but don't hold me to that. All right. I think that was everything. How did I get started on Canvas submitting things? Who asked me a question right before? I forgot to do that. I was gonna, somebody asked me, Vanya asked me that question when we first came in about, can I resubmit? And that resubmit button is, but right at the end of break, somebody asked me a question. Late work still applies. You can submit that late as well. It just shows me how late it is. So I take off points accordingly. Anything else Canvas wise? I mean, either will work. I prefer as, P as Excel sheet for this one because I want to see the formulas. If you download it as a PDF, then I can't see the formulas. It just shows me the numbers. All right, so we've got some practice here for temperature. Um, it's really, again, just takes a little bit of practice and the trickiest thing about temperature is paying attention to your sig figs, which not super thrilling at this point. So for now, I'm gonna skip over this. You get something like 150 Fahrenheit and 273 plus 78 is going to be 91, 361, 351. I slipped 10. Um, and you would keep the, the temperature in Kelvin. You would keep the, the, now it's really off. That's what I was in the middle of doing. Um, you would keep the uncertainty in the ones place since the temperature you started from has the, the uncertainty in the ones place. I need to change, manage to make things worse for this by fiddling with the resolution to try and fix it. I'll play with that more later. All right. <laughs> Um, let's do, so let's do one that is interesting, more interesting than just boiling, melting point of ethanol. Um, one of the coldest temperatures recorded in the continental United States was negative 40 Fahrenheit. Um, what is that in Celsius? Let's say it's negative 
So all we're going to do is now we have our number in Fahrenheit. So you plug it into the TF, temperature in Fahrenheit, and solve for TC. So you need to start by subtracting 32 from both sides, which gives you negative 72.0. And we're keeping the uncertainty in the ones place with that. So then when we divide by 1.8, we keep the uncertainty. We keep three sig figs again. What do we get? Negative 40. So story time. My first year teaching, I thought that this would be a fun question to ask on a final. Um, as a here, show me that you can convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius. And over half the class thought that they were doing something wrong. Um, because no matter what they did, they kept getting the same number out that they put in. Um, I picked this number because I thought it was interesting. This is the temperature where Fahrenheit and Celsius are exactly the same. Negative 40, you don't actually have to specify Celsius or Fahrenheit because they're both the same temperature. Um, I thought that was a cool little tidbit of information that they would think was interesting, but instead everybody just got thrown off and bombed that question. Um, so I don't ask that question anymore, but it is still, I still do find that interesting that there is a point where those two lines cross and they're the same. In Cleveland. It's, it's really unpleasant. It's you start getting to the point, yeah, where, where fuel is solidifying in your fuel lines. And uh, yeah, it's it's not not fun. Um, I have not been negative 40, but my in-laws live in Minnesota and go snowmobiling at 10 to 15 below. Um, so when you add in wind chill, that's pretty chilly too. Um, it's one of the most profoundly unpleasant experiences I've ever had is snowmobiling in that because it's you're sitting on top of a combustion engine so your legs and your hands are burning up and the rest of you is so cold that you can't believe that you have hand warmers and a jacket on it's and meanwhile your visor or your helmet's fogging up because you're sweating because you're sitting on a combustion engine snowmobiling's fun till you get below 10 celsius that's basically the thing Engines in general are uh, a bit dodgy from time to time. All right. Here's a key concept. Kelvin will never be negative. Zero Kelvin is absolute zero, which means it's the point where all molecular motion stops. So in other words, you can't go slower than not moving. So if you ever get a negative number in Kelvin, you did something wrong. It might just be that you forgot that you started with a negative sign, or it could be that you added 273 when you're, or subtracted 273 when you were supposed to add. But point blank, you will never get a negative answer for Kelvin. How to tell me you don't understand Kelvin without telling me you don't understand Kelvin. Write a negative in front of it. <laughs> All right, so temperature is all kinetic energy of molecules, potential energy of molecules. Remember, potential energy for macroscopic objects was how much energy does it have to give away easily? So how far could it fall? How, how much downhill is it from where it would start to where it would end? Um, potential energy at the molecular level is usually considered it is stored more or less in chemical bonds. Um, and those chemical bonds can look like different, a lot of different things, and there's several different ways we can measure that. Um, for instance, the amount of, um, if you look at uh, voltage of a battery, that's electrical energy is another way of measuring potential energy of atoms. Um, but the other way of looking at it is in terms of how much energy is in the bonds. So here's, an example of, uh, of what a combustion reaction looks like at the molecular level. This is just the net result, just like we were talking about before um, with 
with uh, combustion or burning calories in the body. It's really going to be a bunch of different sets, but the net result is you take something like octane, add oxygen to it, and you wind up with CO2 and water. And these bonds have a lot less energy than the bonds that it started with. Carbon carbon bonds and oxygen oxygen bonds are really energy rich, they're unstable. So if you heat them up, basically everything will rearrange to get to become more stable. And in doing so, it gives off energy to the surroundings, right? So it's a form of potential energy. And you could think of it a little bit like um, if I had a, if I balanced, uh, let's see, what's a good analogy? I always go to ping pong balls in a moving box. Um, if you have a bunch of ping pong balls in a moving box and I set it right here, and then it gets knocked over, ping pong balls scatter everywhere, right? The energy that was stored as potential energy by having them sit right here is now turned into kinetic energy because they're bouncing all over the place, it's turned into movement because we went from something unstable to something more stable. All right, and so we can actually use this to do work, to move things. And so this is actually how a combustion engine works is it takes a molecule like octane and oxygen adds a spark to start the reaction to get things going. And that produces a whole bunch of really fast moving small molecules that make the volume expand. And so that's what a cylinder is doing is if you, if you create a small combustion reaction inside a cylinder that has a piston that can move up and down, when that reaction happens, that piston gets pushed outward. And so an internal combustion engine turns the combustion in those cylinders into kinetic energy by spinning a crankshaft, which then with some gears gets turned into um, turning wheels, right? So it's just another form of energy. We don't deal with macroscopic objects. We deal with microscopic objects. So we can't actually see them moving or measure potential energy just in terms of like gravity and how high something is. We measure it in terms of chemical bonds. So given the only way we have of measuring these things is generally going to be temperature change, voltage, if you get into electrochemistry, but we're not there for that for this class. Um, a lot of the ways that we're going to actually measure what's happening are by looking at the temperature. Right, and so, and this one, that's the equation that we ended with the other day, was Q equals mass times specific heat times delta T. But basically that was a really convoluted way of saying, changing that the slope of this line, remember that line that looked like, or the graph of um, kinetic energy of a molecule versus temperature, as your temperature goes up, so is your kinetic energy, right? Okay, that's what temperature is measured. So the slope of this line is where this equation comes from. We said, okay, kinetic energy, the molecule, we're just going to call that the change in the kinetic energy, the molecule, we're going to call that Q. And Q is heat that's defined as, as heat and so the rest of the parts of that slope are delta t remember in science delta if you write just in the triangle means change in and mathematically we say that that's final minus initial so we use delta actually in a lot of things in chemistry the first time you see it though it's almost always delta temperature um and the, another note remember how i told you pay attention to capitalization for units for those prefixes variables too. 
because capital T is not the same thing as lowercase t. What's lowercase t? Give you a hint, it's not temperature. Time, time is lowercase t, temperature is uppercase t. If you mix those up, it's really easy to confuse yourself, right? Because you would think that you needed to plug in some time units here and then your units wouldn't make sense and nothing would make sense and you would lose all, all hope for humanity and end up as a nihilist. So don't do that. Don't mix up your capitalization. It's the first step on the road to nihilism. All right. The other two pieces here, lowercase m is mass when it's a variable. When it's a unit, it's meters. When it's a variable, it's mass. And C sub P is known as specific heat. And that's gonna be unique for every material because the specific heat, which is sometimes called heat capacity, um, is how much energy does it take to change one gram by one degree Celsius? So it's always going to be in these weird combined units. Joules is an energy unit. So it's joules over grams times Celsius. The way we'd say that is joules per gram per degree Celsius. So with that in mind, that, that kind of gives us a little bit of an idea, just like the units on density give us a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about. The units on here are more complicated, but they still, it still tells us something, right? So for instance, the specific heat of water is 4.184 joules over grams degrees Celsius. That means if you have one gram of water, to raise the temperature one degree Celsius takes 4.184 joules of energy. Right? And there's also calories per gram degree Celsius. Calories and joules are the two most common energy units in chemistry. We're gonna mostly stick to joules because that's the SI unit, the metric unit. Um, calories are defined, it's actually defined by the energy that it takes to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. So it's 1.00, did not mean that button, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius and 1.000 calories per gram degree Celsius. So in other words, one calorie is enough energy to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius which does that number seem reasonable? Calories is the energy unit that we have the most experience with. Does that seem like a reasonable number? Maybe. Now, how many grams of water are in your body, roughly? Pick my body so nobody has to say their own body weight. Um, a lot, right? So. I don't know, call it 50,000 grams of water. That means that to raise my body temperature one degree Celsius, you would need 50,000 calories. That's not right, right? Because we eat 2,000 calories and our body is able to main, use that to maintain our body temperature, right? So these calories are not nutritional calories. <laughs> The related, really a nutritional calorie, which in the US, because Americans hate metric prefixes, um, they call a nutritional calorie is a capital C A L. And a capital C A L is equal to one kilocalorie. So all because we have to deal with this because kilocalorie was too much for Americans to stomach. So we have capital C calories instead of lowercase c calories. Um, one kilocalorie is a thousand calories. That's what we're talking about when we say you're eating 
2,000 nutritional calories a day. It's actually 2 million calorie calories, which is that's where all the energy to maintain your body temperature and run your body comes from, right? It's a lot larger amounts than just what's shown here. Than if we were talking about 2,000 lowercase c calories. Can I ask a question? Yeah. What if you, instead of um, adding energy, wanted to take it away? Would this formula work if you, like, vice versa? So if we wanted to, to take energy away, go away. Um, that's all reflected in the change in temperature, right? If something is increasing in temperature, then your final temperature is bigger than your initial temperature, right? So let's say something started at room temperature, 21.0 Celsius, and it went to, I don't know, 45 Celsius. Delta T is final minus initial, right? So it'd be 45, Point zero minus 21.0. So you would get what 24.0 degrees Celsius is delta T. If something started at 45 Celsius and ended at room temperature, you switched final and initial, right? If you switch final and initial, what happens to delta T? It's now negative, which means the energy, the Q term becomes negative. So if we look at this equation, everything else in this equation is always positive. Mass is always positive. You can't have negative mass. Specific heat, well, we just defined it, so you're not all that used to it yet, but if specific heat would, was negative, that would mean that when you put energy into something, the temperature went down. So that doesn't make sense. If there was a substance where you could put it in a kettle on your stove and it got colder, that would make no sense, right? It would break all of the rules of everything that you've ever thought about. Again, road denialism, avoid. So with that in mind, delta T can be negative though, and Q can be negative. So if Q is negative, that means that your object lost energy and the temperature dropped. If Q is positive, your object gained energy and the temperature went up. Right, so those are the only two variables that can be negative out of this whole thing. So that takes care of the, basically the negative sign is what's going to determine what, you know, the negative sign on delta T is going to determine whether something absorbed energy or gave away energy. So let's do an example with this equation. We've talked about it qualitatively a bit. Let's say we burned one gram of table sugar and it produced 16.5 kilojoules of energy. And all of that energy went into a sample of water. What is the temperature change of the water? We're solving for delta T. We don't know what temperature the water started at or where it ended, but we can, we can calculate how much it changed if we just treat delta T like it's one variable, because it is. So first off, CP is in weird units here, or they look weird anyway. Um, I mainly have this in here to show you the other way of writing combined units, especially if, you, if you're typing some, if somebody's typing something out and they want it all to fit neatly on one line of text, a lot of times you don't write it as a fraction in that case. So this times grams to the negative one what does a negative exponent mean? Fraction. fraction, one over, right? 10 to the minus three is one over 10 to the three. So grams to the negative one means one over grams. 
So all that's all these units are saying, it's the same as saying joules per gram per degree Celsius. It's just a way of a more condensed way of writing it. Right, so don't be thrown by that. What's the second issue that we might run into here? We're just trying to solve for delta T. We just need the other three variables, right? So what's Q? Heat, right? So as far as the numbers that are given here, what, what's the, what are we gonna plug in for Q? Room temperature. Room temperature? 16.5. So again, I, I say this and let you flounder for a second to make the point. Heat is not a temperature in science. Heat is energy units. So 16.5 kilojoules, that's the only thing with energy units. So that's our Q. We do need to convert them into regular joules because our specific heat is in regular joules, not kilojoules. So 16.5 kilojoules. What's the conversion for kilojoules to joules? A thousand joules is one kilojoule, right? So now that we're in the realm of things that you don't have physical intuition for, think back to grams and kilograms or meters and kilometers. You know that a kilometer is bigger than a meter, right? So the same way we know that a kilojoule is bigger than A regular joule. So with that in mind, we know Q. We know specific heat because it's given to us. We're trying to find delta T. What do we plug in for M? There are two grams in there, right? The one that's changing temperature is the mass that we want. The water is changing temperature. The other, the sugar is too, but we're measuring, we're calculating delta T for the water. So that means we want the, the delta T, or sorry, the mass of the water. So again, you can, you can use subscripts to, to differentiate. You can say Q of the water equals mass of the water times specific heat of the water, delta T of the water. More writing but it makes it explicitly clear what mass we're supposed to use, what delta T we're solving for, what heat we're using even, right? So when in doubt, if you have more than one of a certain variable, use a subscript to say mass of what? So we wind up with 1.65 times 10 to the four joules equals 120, grams times 4.184 joules gram degree Celsius times delta T. All we're doing is solving for delta T. And if we track the units, grams cancels out grams, right? Because we have grams on top. Actually, let me switch colors. Grams on top and grams on bottom. So they're canceling out. So now we're just in joules per degree Celsius, right? And then we're gonna divide by that. So our units are gonna start looking like So 1.65, 10 to the four joules over, what's 120 times 4.184? 
502.08. That's joules per degree Celsius, right? Equals delta T. Joules on top, joules on bottom cancel out. Our units that we're left with now are one over one over Celsius. So, or you can think of it as one divided by one over Celsius. If we have one divided by one over Celsius, the way that I always keep this straight is I go back to the very first way I ever learned how to divide fractions, which is if you have one over one divided by one over degrees Celsius. How do you divide fractions? Who remembers doing this? Multiply by the reciprocal, right? Which means one over one times degrees Celsius over one. So we wound up with weird looking units, one over one over Celsius, but that just turns into Celsius. And so 16,500 divided by 502, going to give us 33-ish, 32.86, let's keep it to three sig figs, so 32.9. Right, so it's, again, it's algebra. The trickiest part is paying attention to the units and knowing that the units are gonna give you clues, right? Mass of what? We needed our joules, our kilojoules into joules to, in order to ma match the units on our specific heat. If you can keep track of that, the rest of this almost takes care of itself. Watch your units, that tells you what number goes where. All right, we'll do more practice with this. Um, on next week, don't forget to take the quiz this weekend, um, which will open tomorrow, and it'll be on some some um, temperature change problems, some simple ones, not tricky ones. <laughs> You can, there are, there are ways you can apply energy to slow things down. So think about when somebody's swinging on a swing, if you want them to go higher, you can put energy in, but you have to time it right, right? If you want some, if you want to slow somebody down on a swing, you still have to put energy in, right? You just time it so that as they're coming towards you, you're slowing them down instead of speeding them up when they go away from you. So that's how laser cooling works. They use a different property that we're going to talk about next week. Um, they use the fact that certain, when things evaporate, the area around them gets cold, cold because the energy that was in its surroundings goes into moving them from a liquid to a gas. So they use evaporative cooling for the most part. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's what the issue is. So it should show up fine on mine once you upload it. Okay. And yeah. yeah, but when in doubt, you can always do that. Just like screenshot it instead. But um, but that that Excel sheet that you that you have downloaded should you can upload that, and I will be able to see it just fine. Well, just making sure because I perfect. I appreciate that. You want credit for a tricky one like that, right? No. Okay. Tomorrow's Thursday. Um, I get there a little after 10 because I class, in, um, not in here, but I class till 10. So I think it's 10.30 to 11.30, but I get there usually at, you know, five past 10.
Uh, what do I have going on tomorrow? Um, yes, we can do that. Because your class starts at 10? 10 to 11. Yeah, so so you're not gonna be able to see me before that. So just come by afterwards. I'll show you that. Thanks. Thanks.